Welcome to our online service. We are so glad to have you with us. My name is Nathan and I'm the lead pastor here at Orange Baptist Church. We would love to keep blessing you and one of the key ways you can partner with us is by sharing and liking and subscribing to this channel uh, and sharing this content through a whole multitude of platforms uh, so that we might see other people blessed in the good news of Jesus. Another key way of partnering with us is that if you are blessed by this, that you might consider partnering with us financially here uh, at the work of Orange Baptist Church. And then one of the key ways to do that is through our online giving platform and the details for that are below in the description. We wanna be praying for you and we want you to connect with us. So if you need prayer at any point along the way, please shoot us an email at prayer at orangebaptistchurch.org.au and a team of people are waiting to pray with you and for you. And if you are ever in the local vicinity of Orange in New South Wales, please drop in, come and see us on a Sunday morning. We would love to worship with you and to celebrate Jesus together. Be blessed. The sun comes up and gives us life in the same way that you do. We give you our thanks for the written Gospels, and particularly for the Gospel of Luke, and for Luke himself, who faithfully recorded many things in written form, able to do this because he was inspired and empowered by you, Holy Spirit. So as we explore this together, could you give to us desire to be captivated by Jesus and what Jesus said, not only on special occasions, but on all occasions. Jesus, our healer, thank you for all those who have been healed or who are being healed in their bodies and in their spirits, that you have answered our requests. As coronavirus comes in contact with more of us and some become infected, we look to you to hold back the bad effects from that and speed our recovery. And we ask this especially for those who, for whatever reason, are more vulnerable. Yesterday was a special one for the Nelson family, Lord. We ask for your blessings to be upon them in this chapter of their life, that their hope will remain firmly in you and it will be fully realised as they trust in you together. We have seen your hand at work and may that continue and only increase. For Danny and family, we ask for your, <clears throat> your measure of comfort in their grief. Strengthen them for what lies ahead as they reorganise their life without Shirley and work towards finalising her earthly affairs. And Lord, we think of Cambodia, a country rather different to ours with different needs. Thank you that we have been able to partner with Baptist World Aid projects there in the community and and helping uh, rescue those who are involved in, in trafficking. And we pray also for other Baptist World Aid activities there with, with children uh, being sponsored, aiming to keep them at school more than would otherwise happen. And as they uh, deal with the effects of coronavirus too in that country. We thank you for our local council that you've given to us to be leaders in our community and govern the affairs of our city. We ask for your blessing on Mayor Jason and Deputy Mayor Gerald and all the councillors working together. Give them the ability and the energy they need to do their jobs and an appreciation of the important needs of people in Orange. Keep us from being caught up in valuing people on what resources they have to invest with. Uh, with your guidance and power, we can make Orange a city where people in all stages of life feel welcomed and that they have a go. May your kingdom come, Lord. Amen. Bible reading this morning is from Luke chapter 6, verse 43 to 49. A tree and its fruit, the wise and foolish builder. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognised by its own fruit. 
People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. They are like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. (coughs) When a flood came, the torrent struck that house but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. Lord Jesus, now as we come to your word, as we come to the words that you spoke, I ask that you would deal graciously with us, that these are tough words and these are challenging words, but we just want to recognise, or at least I want to recognise, that you aren't saying these from a hurtful place. These challenges aren't just to hurt. Uh, these, these challenges are because you love us so much that your good is the greatest good we could possibly have. And so we recognise that we often run outside of your good And by your grace and in your love, you redirect us back into your truth. And sometimes, Lord, we recognise that that is a gentle prodding. Other times it's a prod, but a little less gentle. So I pray for myself and for my brothers and sisters here uh, that we would take your words seriously, that we would be brave and courageous Uh, to look at our lives and to reflect upon them uh, and that we might live differently and that we might interact with you a little differently as well. And I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. While we're in this series that's going to run for more weeks yet to come, we do come to the end of chapter 6 in the Gospel of Luke. And right up to this point, as James has mentioned, uh, who preached last week, uh, that this is a significant section of teaching that Jesus had given to his disciples and to the kind of gathering crowds around him. And he'd kind of unpacked that the reality is that in him that we see the coming of the kingdom of God. And we see the coming of the kingdom of God because Jesus himself is king and he is God and he is breaking into the world. So therefore, the kingdom of God is breaking into the world. Does that make sense? Because he is the kingdom, he is the king and he's here Uh, But we also know that while the the kingdom isn't yet fully manifest because we know that Jesus died, he rose again and he's coming again and we're living in this in-between time. And in this section of Scripture, along with many others, including in the Gospel of Matthew and then later on more teachings here in the Gospel of Luke, what we're given is this mandate on how we as citizens, new citizens of the Kingdom of God, those who are disciples of Jesus, are to live in this world now, waiting for the fullness of the Kingdom of God to come. So this helps us to unpack what it means for us to live as followers of Jesus, disciples of the King, citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And it would make sense then that as the King comes and ushers in a new kingdom, that he would teach us a new way to live. Because if he didn't, then we would just be living as citizens of the world with one foot in the the citizenship in the kingdom of heaven, and that would be weird, right? If Jesus came to restore us and to redeem us because we were outside of his kingdom, we we therefore need to come into his kingdom and be taught a new way. Otherwise, we would just be dual citizens, homeless, without anywhere. And so Matthew, sorry, in the Gospel of Luke, it's been really made abundantly clear for us. We know that as citizens of the kingdom of God, that there's good news for us. We know that we, as those who have been impacted by the kingdom, has been impacted by Jesus, that we are now now called to follow a radical way of love, a different type of love that the world offers. 
a love that is sacrificial, a love that is full of mercy and a love that is full of grace to others, not condemnation and judgmentalism. Uh, We saw that with James unpacking for us that very nature last week with the speck and the log in the eye. We are to live differently because of Jesus. And so as as he unpacks this for us, he gets to the very end here and he kind of goes in this incredible way of summing up a lot of what he's teaching. And so it's no longer just conceptual. Jesus is very clear that there's a deep expectation that we are going to live differently. It's not just going to be cerebral. It's not just going to be knowledge, that this knowledge is going to translate into real life, practical components on how we live now. And he kicks off with this image that many of us are very well uh, kind of versed in. The whole idea of uh, good fruit versus bad fruit. It begins here in verse 43. No good, fr- no good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognised by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. Now at this point... Um, most people kind of spend a heck of a lot of time uh, unpacking what a briar is uh, and what a thorn bush is and unpacking deep agricultural processes to make sure that you can do all that you need to do to produce good fruit. But as I read it, it's just really clear. I don't know how much unpacking we need here, right? Right? It's a, pretty, it's a pretty easy concept to understand. Oh, it's harder to live, but it's way easier to understand, right? So a good tree produces good fruit. And good fruit means that you look at the tree and go, good tree. Good tree gives good fruit. Fantastic. Do you know what's a bad tree? The one that produces bad fruit. <laughs> deep, right? Deep, so deep. It's simple, And you can easily identify a fig tree because it's got figs in it. Gary gave me one earlier. I was going to use it as an illustration. I haven't eaten it yet, but I promise I will. And so it's easy identifiable, right? It's not complicated. Except that Jesus takes this agricultural image and he just applies it to us. And this is where it gets hard. Easy concept, really difficult to live. He says this, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Jesus is really clear here. He goes, what fruit are you bearing? From your heart but the heart is shaped by the things that we say. There's this question that is asking fundamentally, are you a good tree? Not whether you can look externally and judge if that is a good tree or that person is producing fruit. No, no, there's an internal question that says, what kind of, what kind of fruit am I delivering? What kind of fruit am I giving? Is it good fruit or is it bad fruit? Is it coming out of a wellspring of evil, which we will discover is not quite what you think it is? Not in least in this context. But to produce good fruit, well, that's going to take some effort, right? Like you don't just have good in your heart and then as you walk around because of all the goodness in our heart, it just springs forth. No, no. In reality... We're struggling, aren't we, to produce good fruit knowing that sometimes it isn't all that good. It takes a concerted amount of investment and effort and purpose and direction and time and money that takes into producing good fruit. It's not just simple. You don't just lie around. There's work to be done. Karen and I, we, we went for a drive on Friday and as we're going up around the Pinnacle and Canobles Road and all the other bits and pieces, I stopped and it was just blown away by the size of the orchards that were out there. But, but more than that, the sheer volume of effort and money that goes into producing that fruit, 
that, that we just don't even consider much of. Like for us, I don't have any fruit trees. So, so for me to get fruit, I'm going to go to Woolies or somewhere like that. I'm going to buy an apple that costs me, I don't know, 30 cents. Do you know how many apples you have to produce to sell? And they don't even get that much. The farmer doesn't even get that much. But do you know how much money is invested and how much work is invested just for one cheap piece of fruit? You go out there and there's like nets, right, that are worth squillions of dollars that let, let in just the right amount of light, but not too much. And they let enough water through and to make sure that there's still going to be enough water, there's millions of dollars worth of ag pipe all the way through and irrigation to make it work. There's soil testing. There's a whole bunch of stuff that's got to take place. You don't just kind of go, oh, I'm going to be, an, I'm going to be a primary producer. I'm going to put some trees in the ground. And I'm going to make money. Stupid, isn't it? Then why do we do that with Christianity? Why why do we do that in our relationship with the Lord? See, because like me, I'm sure, sometimes there's good fruit. And shamefully, there's other times where it's not so great. But there's this question of spiritual maturity that comes here in this. And there's going to be an intentional investment if we're going to produce good things for the glory of God. It isn't just going to happen. There's going to take work and effort and energy. It's going to be more than just cerebral. It's going to turn into something more, which is why when, when Jesus here says, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart and an evil man brings evil things out of evil stored up in his heart, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Now, often we jump into this passage and we say, ah, so that's like the naughty words and you know a bit of harshness over here and the likes. And while that is true, that's not what this is getting at directly here. Because the very next verse gives us a clue as to the things that are spoken and lived out. Take a look here in verse 46. Why do you call me? So there's out of the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? At that point... Jesus has taken a three iron and he's just gone, I'm not even calling four. Whack! This is the moment, right? So we we can't dumb this down. We can't just moralise this a little bit. This is the moment where Jesus goes out out of the heart, our mouth speaks, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and then just not do what I tell you to? That is evil. That's silliness. It's foolishness to look upon Jesus and say, you are Lord. It's, it's the correct statement, isn't it? It's the correct statement that those who are around calling him Lord, they are ascribing to him who he really is. Absolutely. They're saying all the right things, except that's all that is taking place. What is not taking place is the cry of our heart turning into a reality in our life over here. So out of all that Jesus has unpacked so far in chapter 6, how we love radically, how we are not to be judgmental, using wisdom and discernment, absolutely, but not in a condemning kind of way because only he's judge. In the moments we don't do that, but yet we go, Lord, 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 you are Lord, but I'm going to live as I please. I'm going to keep falling into these things and I'm not going to acknowledge them because I'm a little deluded and think that I've got things in control. That, that is, well, evil. And evil is just simply the opposite of good and God is entirely good, right? So, so it gets me thinking. It gets me thinking. Do we just say, Lord, Lord? And and then does that translate into the way that we live? Now, I I know this is hard and I was just talking to someone out the back and they're like, oh, it's really brutal. You know, when do we get to the the gracious bit? I'm like, in here. 
right, right here. Because we've got to remember who the one who is calling this out. It's Jesus himself. And Jesus isn't just going to be talking about this kind of hypothetical understanding of what, how we should live and then not live it out. Jesus himself, not too long from here, is going to walk his way into Jerusalem and he's going to land himself upon a cross, not by accident, but by willing choice to lay down his life to redeem us from evil, from redeem us from going our own way so that we would experience the goodness and greatness of God. And if God is entirely good, and He is, and God is entirely gracious, and He is, then would He not only give us good things to do because it would be for our best? So when we hear this and we go, that's really harsh, it's because we're failing to see the glory of God and the goodness of what Jesus is giving us here. It's butting up against what our heart wants versus what we know to be true in Jesus. And this is why it's hard. It's full of grace and mercy. It is because Jesus is trying to reorientate us. He's challenging us to say, do we take him seriously enough? Or do we just cry out, Lord, Lord, do we say the right things and then just live in a way that dishonours the name in which we call upon? And that's hard because it's a question of allegiance, isn't it? To have a Lord is to have a master. And to have a master means that we are under the master. And to be under the master means that we do as the master says and he is an entirely good master so it makes sense that we would do it. So do we call upon him and say, Lord, Lord, and then not do what he says? And, and here... That means that do we call him Lord, Lord, and then not love radically? Do we not call him Lord, Lord, and stand against sin? Do we not call him Lord, Lord, and then not be generous and hospitable and gracious? Do, do we not? Of course we do, because that is the way of the master. That is the way of the Lord, and that is the way of his kingdom. So how are we doing at this? To call him Lord, Lord, and not do what he says means that we don't produce good fruit. So how tasty are we? Are we sweet? Is there good things coming from us? That's the challenge for us. And then to go even further than that, Jesus then takes us into verse 47. He says this, Whoever, as anyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I'll show you what they're like. So while he, on the one hand, he challenges us, he goes, but I'll give you a good picture of what it looks like, all right? So, so just so you're aware, so that you can have it and help weigh this up. Let, let me show you what it looks like to be good, to, uh, to follow him and to produce good fruit, to, to put into practice the things in which he has commanded us and told us to do. And, and this, is, this is how it says to, to the way that it operates. Sorry, I got the wrong passage here. It says here, uh, in verse 47, he says, As for anyone who comes to me and hears my words and put them into practice, I'll show what they are like. They are like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on the rock. When the flood came and the torrent struck that house but could not shake it because it was well built, but the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built his house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck the house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. It gives us another analogy of going, okay, so, so do you call me Lord, Lord, and then, and then, and then do it? Because that's smart. Like, that's super wise, Yeah. That's like getting an engineer to make sure that the foundations are dug down deep enough that they are resting on the rock, that this is a really good thing. Or are we like the ones who don't build on a solid foundation? 
and then find when life hits us, that we begin to crumble. That's, that's the image that's put here. And often when this is kind of read and taught and, and, and the likes, how we do this, we, we kind of liken this to, to those who are Christian and those who are not, or those who read their Bible and those that don't, right? That's, that's, that's not what he's saying here. It doesn't get as simple as that. Although that is true, here he's talking to people who call him Lord, Lord. He's questioning those who call him Lord, Lord, and then either do or don't. This isn't about non-Christians versus Christians. No, 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 no. This is about those who say Lord, Lord, and then either do or don't. That's what it is. That's what's hitting out of here. Because it's fundamentally important for us to understand this. And not just to understand this, but our understanding that is shaped into our actions. Because if we go through this process where we call Lord, Lord, and we don't do as He says, the house in which we built will fall. And it will look like this in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 to 23. Not everyone who will say to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father. Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoer. The one who says, Lord, Lord, and then doesn't do it in him, who only does things to make themselves look good. It's hard, isn't it? It's hard. But this is the reality in which we live. This is about being known by Jesus and knowing Jesus. And knowing Jesus means that we want to submit ourselves to Him. And as we submit ourselves to Him, we continue to build this firm foundation so that we continue to live as a house until such time as He comes, right? This is the in-between times. And we are building our home. Is it value or is it not? Has it got a firm foundation or is it wishy-washy? Do you know how you tell? You you tell through the floodings and the storms that lap at your door. And you see what happens. You see what happens. Because the storms will expose the reality of whether we live for Jesus or we we just acknowledge him. You know what happens to those homes? It's kind of apt that at the moment we we think about, you know, the northern rivers and, and Queensland and all the floods, in fact, all of eastern Australia. And you see this time and time again, these the waters exposing faulty building. Right? Well, the aftermath isn't just mud, it's an exposing of what was underneath that, whether the builders were actually decent, whether the engineers knew what they were doing or not. Right? You build in floodplains, there's a fair chance you're going to get flooded. So you need to do your due diligence to make sure that you can stand when it inevitably comes. Right? And this time, there is this great exposing of us, I believe, honestly, that this is incredible exposing of us at the moment and looking at our foundations, not just here at Orange Baptist Church, but Christians the world over. As the storms rage around us, whether that's coronavirus or wars or rumours of wars, these things are exposing what is underneath whether we are just saying, Lord, Lord, and then finally seeing things as as it's going badly for us. And so we become so gripped with fear that we fail to live faithfully to what Jesus has called us to because our circumstances are hard. If that's the case, then this, this passage really is not fun, is it? We 
we, we look at this and this is a picture of what it means to be or a challenge to be spiritually mature, isn't it? To acknowledge Jesus, to live in him, to live in his kingdom, to not only acknowledge him, but to obey him. Right, And we would think naturally that the longer we walk with Jesus, the more mature we would become, the more we would acknowledge him and live for him. Right? That would make sense. But I think the biggest drama is, is that we haven't done the work in cultivating the fruit. We haven't put the time and the energy to make sure that everything is stable, where the right light comes through, where the, the light amount of rain comes in and, and, and there's weeds that are being tended to. We just kind of think that it's just going to happen. And the reality is the longer we walk with the Lord, the more mature we think we're becoming. But in reality, the more spiritually immature we actually are landing at. And this is the litmus test. It is the litmus test. Now is the litmus test. Do we hold on to Jesus? Do we live on Him? Do we obey Him when things are tough? We've spent two years in a pandemic. Two years. And I have watched it divide Christians to the point where with some are so gripped with anxiety and fear that they fail to live in the freedom of Jesus. They are so afraid. They're so afraid. They even fail to see that Jesus is Lord, that every day of our life has been ordained. Now that doesn't mean that we aren't wise and we aren't discerning and we just, we're not going to be frivolous about it. But ultimately we have to ask the question, if we're going to be constrained to the point where we're not going to be faithful in that because well, it's a little risky, then, then what are we doing? Right? And then you got the other side to it, which is people just running amok and just not caring about anyone else around them at any point along the way. And that too is foolish. Both of these fail to see Jesus as Lord and live in light of His grace. It goes even further than that. When the storms of life come and all of a sudden that our portfolios aren't quite doing what we want them to do, that we just go, you know what, we just need to pull back on our generosity. Let's go, just go pull back on that. We do it as a nation. Things are a little tough right now. We couldn't possibly help the, the most vulnerable in the world. That would be foolish, wouldn't it? I mean, we've got to take care of ourselves. And then we do it with each other. No, oh, I'm really sorry. I'd love to be generous, but, you know, the share market's dipped a little bit and, you know, the property market's really stabilised and, you know, there's risks involved. And so, you know, you know, I know Jesus says to be, to be generous to the point where it hurts, but, but you know what? Oh, just a little bit. That'd be all. It's fine. Just exposes our heart, right? Even further than that, we go, yeah, I've just kind of fallen out of the rhythms, you know, the rhythms of life. And, and so, you know, there's stuff on now. And so, you know, gathering with God's people, you know, I know that's what we're supposed to do and, and whatever. And Jesus is, is Lord. But, you know, now there's so many more available options, right? So, so we're going to just, you know, we're, we're just doing it purely online now. You know, just, you know, it's just, it's just easier. It just works with us. Yeah, yeah, to, to a point, and there's good reasons to there, but, but we can't fail to live out Hebrews 10 that says, don't stop meeting together as some of you are in the habit of doing, and all the more as the day of the Lord approaches. Isn't that interesting? Hebrews 10 tells us, the closer we are supposed to come to Jesus' return, the more we're supposed to meet together. And out of fear, the less we meet together, the closer Jesus is coming. Am I missing something? Scripture says, meet all the more, the closer the day is coming. And we go, nah, oh, just a little bit. I'm tired. And things on. Yeah, we all do. It's either whether Jesus is Lord or he's not. Don't fool ourselves into thinking that the longer we've known Jesus, the more spiritually mature we will ordinarily just become. In fact, I think the longer we go on, the risk of becoming spiritually immature is actually greater because we rest on what we've done before. 
right? We rest on what we've done before. I've done that before. I was involved in that before. I did that for Jesus before. Now, now's my time. All right. Hmm. Wow. Luke 6 sucks, doesn't it? And then this isn't just a you, this isn't me too. Because what, what this means is we have to actually say to ourselves, am I living, honestly, mature Christianity, am I living out the obediences of Jesus or am I still trying to pick and choose and still say, Lord, Lord? Because that is someone who builds their house that ends up looking like that. And do you know what happened when this took place? Everyone said, but we did all the work so that that would never happen again. Look at, look at this. These are modern homes in the northern beaches, right? Look at the break wall that they built. They had machines that came in and moved really big rocks. They dug even deeper foundations and put more steel and more concrete. You can see it. It's in the water, including someone's pool, which I think is a a tragic irony for that person. (laughs) For me, it was a chuckle because I don't own a pool. Did, Did you see what I'm saying? The longer we go on, the the more we think our foundations are deeper and stronger. And yet when the wave comes, oh, we might be mature in areas, but we need to keep working out of spiritual maturity in every area. And do you know why? Because it's good for us. God wouldn't have told us and commanded it if it wasn't good for us. This is only hard if you don't see that God's good is the best good. This is only hard when you still are grappling and trying to wrestle with the idea that your good for yourself might still be a bit better than Jesus's. And so there's a question of relinquishing, perhaps. I don't mean to offend me or you. It's not my intention, but I have to be faithful to the Scriptures. And and that's what Jesus said. And and so I guess we're going to have to take it seriously. You don't have to, but there's going to be consequences. We just can't be upset with the consequences of the choices that we make. How many of us have told that to our kids? And so now it's wisdom from me, (laughs) to me. (laughs) None of us are perfect. This, this This is grace. This is God by his love, grabbing us by the shoulders and turning us towards himself. The question is whether we're too busy going, bugger off, get off me. But thanks, Lord. But just stop it. That's the question. And and in that, only you can answer. Only you can answer. I want to trust that the Spirit of God, who is alive and living and active, who wants to bring transformation in us so that the transformation of the world might be complete in Christ. I'm going to trust that he is at work in you now, that He is exposing areas of immaturity in him where you might do business with him and take him seriously so that we might together become a house built on a solid foundation for the glory of the name of Jesus. So take a moment and allow the Spirit to whisper into your heart. Holy Spirit, give us ears to hear you. Lord, 
Lord Jesus, soften our hearts towards you. That we, Father, might live in grateful, joy-filled obedience to you. Lord, I, I long to be mature in you. I long for that for this community of faith. And so I ask, Lord, that you would do your work in us. That we wouldn't just be a people who call you Lord, Lord, and then just live for ourselves. Or that we wouldn't just be a people who call you Lord, Lord, and live like the rest of the world. But that we would call you Lord, Lord, and live displaying the beauty and magnificence of your kingdom, that we would live out of the incredible sacrifice and grace that you have lavished upon us in you, our Lord Jesus. Lord, may we hear this as a loving rebuke from you, our Father. Strip away our pride and our arrogance. Strip away our own selfish expectations. And allow ourselves to be shaped by you. To you to redirect our thinking and our behaviour and our attitude and our purpose. Bring us to full maturity in you. Let us be your people, we ask Jesus. Amen. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Yeah.